Okay, hello guys. It's Nico here in the Akuma Podcast. We talk. I've got a special guest today, which means she's from around. Please can you introduce yourself. Tell us more about yourself, please. Hi, I'm Ebony Dole. I am originally from El Salvador. I was born in El Salvador, but I moved away with my family when I was very young, so I was maybe six. And then because of my dad's work, we moved around. And I lived, grew up in different countries. And I arrived in Scotland in 2005. Yeah. And I came here to study. And then after some time, I moved away. And then more recently, in 2016, I came back. And I'm now permanently living here. Wow. So you like Scotland? Good weather? Yeah, it's great weather. <laughs> <laughs> but you know now because we're well now it's turning more tropical so today we had a lot of tropical rain which is fun yeah i think that that's the that's the reason actually i, I, I brought you on this podcast because i know you love outdoors your work you like working on the gardens projects and stuff like that but if you can tell us more a little bit just take us to your journey of your love of nature well i guess i always spent a lot of time outdoors. I was lucky to have parents who enjoyed spending time out on the beach or out in the mountains, out in the forest. And so I guess my love of nature started from a very early age. And then over, as I've developed professionally, I have also somehow chosen uh, opportunities that have allowed me to be outside a lot. So. Um, I'm professionally a linguist um, wow. and I work with indigenous people and a lot of the work that I've done with indigenous people has revolved around the topic of plants and um, and how this knowledge and the importance of plants with uh, indigenous identity. So mm. that was also fun and then since completing that work I've started working uh, as a community gardener and community chef, so it's called a food worker. But it's great because I get to spend, again, um, my working time is completely outdoors. Um, and I get to have conversations with people about what being outdoors means, what um, what their different types, how much they yeah. know about being outside. And we, because it's also a very yeah. international group, we get to uh, exchange uh, information and knowledge yeah. from different countries which is fun i think that sounds great i always got this question to people i'm i also love nature but not as much like as you got knowledge but this one is it's a general question like i always hear the people like oh you can actually talk to plants i have so much plants i don't know where to start a conversation with a plant <laughs> maybe you can just give me like a i'm not saying you talk to plants but i'm, I'm just saying i don't i don't think about that. no well, no, I don't speak to them, but I sing to them. <laughs> sing? That's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I sing to my plants. Oh, that's... See, like, um... Uh... <laughs> and I know some people actually like to play music for their plants. Yeah, I, I think you're right, because I think I was, um, I was sharing a story, I remember, with you, like, when I was talking, uh, Dr. Daniel Four in is an American, uh, was called like a traditional medicine guy. I was saying you can talk to your plants, you can dream about your plants and stuff. Like, I think that would be amazing though, which means it's quite good. But yeah, that's the thing. Like um, people are close to nature. I think we all got different maybe levels how to communicate with with with, um, with with the planet itself instead of. So yeah, for me, I like to go back when you say you teach in um, what's called indigenous people. Because when you say that word, for example, for me, I don't know what mm -hmm. what kind of people is that. It's like people live in the forest or uh, the tribes or yeah. Maybe if you can touch that a bit, so people can really get to follow you. Okay, so um, an indigenous person, yeah. Yeah. I guess for me um, and for my work, we really refers to an, a native, someone who is originally uh from that geographical area so sometimes i jokingly call 
native white British people, indigenous people, because they're indigenous to this island. Yeah. Um, and in the case of uh, Central America, the indigenous people would have been um, those who were resident there before uh, the Americas were colonized. Mm. Um, and I think this is something that can be applied to any geographical area. But obviously, like, it's complicated because people migrate, people move, and being resident or having a history or an ancestry belonging tied to a land doesn't mean that you have more right to be there or less right to be there. Um, so, but my work, my work was specifically with um, those that had been there since the time of colon colonization or since before the colonization. And in my case, it refers to um, a minority of people um, and they're called Nawa Pipil. Um, yeah. And I worked only with, because as a linguist, I was interested in language. So I only worked with speakers of the language Nawa Pipil. Oh, nice. Um, and in El Salvador, there are, there are maybe like 300 speakers. So it's a very, very small language. Mm. Um, and and I think going back to what you were asking is like, is it tribes people or do they live in the jungle? In in the case of El Salvador and also the case of many other countries, indigenous people are actually urban. So they have, because of the way that we view land today, that you, land is something that can be owned, um, a lot of indigenous people have been displaced from their lands. So have been pushed out of living in the forest or living in the woods or living in the mountains and have um, sometimes by choice, sometimes by force, have been moved to more urban sites. Um, and in many cases as well, um, there is often a history of oppression that goes alongside being indigenous. Um, and that oppression can also uh, take the form of being told that you can't speak your language or that you can't practice your religion or that you can't um, be connected to, to nature and the spirituality of nature in the same way. Mm. Um, and in El Salvador, it was specifically outlawed. So it was made illegal to practice anything to do with indigeneity. So um, the indigenous people of El Salvador look very much like anyone else in El Salvador. Yeah, that, that's um, so that's why I also focus specifically on that. Oh, that's nice. That's really amazing because I've got a similar story, but see, like, I don't know, I'm from Zimbabwe, but I, I did live in Botswana in a young age, and I was in the village also. We've got a group of people also called Bushmen, but, but it's not, that's not really their name, that tribe Bushmen, because that's where the white people, when they came, they did not know to find who they are. You know, but in my language, you know, we call them Amasili. Amasili, I don't know that language, that, that word, it is my language, but it cannot translate anything to me. You know what I mean? I, I don't really understand it, mm -hmm. what that means. But it means these kind of people, I must say, but I'm trying to, mm -hmm. to to figure out what is what that means. You know, it doesn't make sense to me because they look like us. The only thing they don't believe living like us in the house is they, they keep on moving in the, in the, in the forest. And some mm -hmm. like, uh, I think the whole world, because some of these people, like in Brazil, mm -hmm. similar, but in Africa it's kind of much less numbers now because some people they use them for labor, take them to work in you know I mean in their houses. So the culture has been stolen from them. They no longer like actually exist as such. Even if you meet them in the forest, they're already wearing clothes now yeah. and stuff. So yeah, when I seen that, because that time mm -hmm. I think I was young, I didn't pay so much attention to it but as soon as i moved to europe and it's learning things meeting people like yourself and talking to people who, who actually studied this kind of historical you start like oh this is how it works they they, they are selling the land and they're kicking people on the land you know what i mean so it's, yeah it's sad but i think um yeah i thank you so much for that but now we're moving to the topic that the world is boiling with it's called the climate change i know you might have maybe some similar views like me, but I want I want to really get to talk about this issue every time I got a guest on the show, 
because it is our duty actually to actually yeah have a chat like i know you love the outdoor as well so maybe you can surprise me tell me something uh, what do you think what's your views by the way like do you think the climate change is getting worse or it's getting better or we're going to reach the the target of numbers that they talk about 1.5 degrees i don't know I think it's absolutely getting worse. Um, and I think I, yeah, I was saying to you that the last three days in Glasgow, we've seen very tropical rain, um, which is very heavy, very sudden. And we've had thunderstorms. And while part of me uh, is likes it because it's very familiar, um, the other part of me knows that in Glasgow and, and in the UK and in all of these other places where we've had flash flooding, like in China and in Germany, mm. I know that the infrastructures of these cities um, aren't used to this kind of extreme weather conditions. Mm. Um, and m climate change is very real, it's definitely happening, but my fear is that um, governments aren't really going to be able to react fast enough to change the infrastructure in order for us to continue living in the same way. And so we absolutely need to adapt the way we're living. And I think that human beings are very capable of adapting. History has shown that. Um, but we just, and more people need to wake up to it and more people need to sort of start reacting and just changing our habits. Yeah. Um, which obviously isn't going to be easy, but it's also very possible. I, I do agree with you. Uh, for me, there's one thing I've always been, I, I, was, I was in a group today as well on the climate change group. Uh, some would chat, but for me, I always struggle about, um, I know I live in Europe now, but I'm also worried about Africa because that's where I'm from. And this is, this is the part of the world that is part of me. Is the plastic, uh, the way the plastic consumed in Africa, it's, it's, it's a me it's, it scares me because um, you, there's no way you're going to get rid of that because what happens when the plastic's been used, they dump it on the big dump. Then the poor people are going to dig it again, go and sell it again to the factories who are making stuff. So until the, the Western countries or whatever countries that stop sending plastics in Africa, because this is my imagination, right? If I was in Africa, like, because of maybe I'm be, becoming a little bit smart, I will make sure everything is done by wood. You know, I mean, like have like, some baskets when you go in the shop, you can carry a basket done by wood, not plastic. So maybe you cut some. This one is about uh, environmental uh, disaster. That's what I'm trying to say. So, yeah, yeah, climate change, you're right. It's, it's yeah. very... Well, it... Go ahead. Um, sorry. Uh, well, it made me think that a lot of the time, um, people who live in uh, poor areas, they're um, trying to access things that are cheap. Um, because maybe mm -hmm. they don't have as many resource, uh, access to resources. And for example, things like, and I see this also in El Salvador, that um, a lot of people think uh, in El Salvador, uh, most houses are built with clay um, and that actually cools down the temperature of, of the urban sites. Um, but you see now that more and more people are switching over to concrete, switching over to, to using tin roofs, um, which actually increases the temperature because they become very hot and there's it's the yeah the walls and the, the roofs aren't, aren't able to breathe and so one of the things that I find is really a shame is that we're not valuing traditional construction methods or traditional materials like like wood or like uh, different grasses and, and instead people are because they think that this is the right thing to do, switching over to the use of plastics, the use of, of man-made materials that aren't actually friendly. Um, and I think one of the, the ways that the conversations around climate change have failed is that they haven't included uh, people who don't have access to a lot of information or have a lot of mistrust. So for the most part, it's been, um, yeah, seen as a, a middle class issue. And it's very much not a middle class issue. It's very yep. much something that um, those who have less access to resources will be very more affected by. Mm. Like, uh, 
you see, like, I like sharing stories with my guests anyway, because that's why we're here. So, like, yesterday I was watching a very sad documentary in about Chinese in, in Africa. The building, the same houses, we just talk about these concrete houses in Angola, for example, Zambia, and many more countries in Africa. Well, it looks nice when you look outside because that's kind of like, oh, yeah, we want to change these poor people to be look model. But they, they don't talk about what, what, what's the... Um, What's the word called? What do they use on this material to, to build these houses? Is it really good for climate change or is just, for me, I think it's work, it's making it worse. Africa is already hot. Imagine if you, if you, yeah, if you look at these houses mm -hmm. and, and again, when you look at the construction, they don't employ Africans. They bring their own people to work there and finish and go. So it's kind of like, yeah, not, not go to political. I'm just looking at environmental style. Some Africans are happy. I seen them. They're like, "Oh, now I can have water in the house, inside the house. I can." I was like, "Yeah, I don't know. It's it's, it's a difficult one because, as you said, um, some people cannot afford stuff. But when China comes and offer people cheap stuff, and makes looks nice, um, it's confusing. But before, because I don't, um, before we leave, I think we should end up with food because I know you 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 like cooking food." And you make your own bread, which means very exciting. Mm -hmm. So basically, I just wanted to tell us that, just close up about saying, what healthiest food people should actually, yeah, just talk about your food. I, I want to hear that. Um, so the, the way I eat most about the food I make is I like uh, fermenting or anything that's fermented. So that includes the, the sourdough. So I make my own sourdough bread. Um, and then I also like to ferment cabbage and like basically any vegetable. And what I like about fermenting and pickling is that it's one of the oldest ways of preserving food um, that has stood the, yeah, survived the test of time. And that it's something that, that is also really healthy. And, and you know, when you're, cause when you're fer fermenting, you're introducing all of the bacteria the good bacteria that's present in your hands, that's present uh, in your surroundings, and you're introducing that into the into the vegetable that you're preparing, and it also makes it much more um, easy to digest for the human body. And, and then that means we get all of the nutrients um, that are really beneficial for us. So that's what I really like doing, and it's something that everybody can do. Um, but I also enjoy teaching people how easy it is to have a nice meal that's not expensive, that's really healthy yeah. and enjoyable to make. I think that's that's really nice because, um, as you say, I was in a group. We, we end up talking about the uh, vegetarians and vegans, and I said sometimes I eat meat. I eat meat. I don't like to, but now sometimes I feel guilty when I'm around by my friends who are vegetarians and vegan. I'm thinking this is bad, but. So we're trying to find a balance. How do we actually, we're all working together as a group to fight climate change, environmental, and eating healthy. And then for me, I was born in Africa. First thing, your mom holds you before your teeth, they shove in the meat in your mouth anyway. You just like start eating meat from the zero age. So it become like, uh, kind of like a traditional thing. Um, and again, we need to accept the world's changing, of course. We, we can't be hold on from the past and stuff. So, so I was like, then one guy, uh, he, he, he made ex exactly the point you're making earlier on about it depends how much man, some people cannot afford to do these vegan, um, vegetarian meals or to be a vegan. Some people's vegan is a choice because that's what they are. But, but I think someone was saying like the past four or five years, the vegan and vegetarian, it went up. People actually changed the diet to go to veg, vegetarian and um, vegan, which is a good thing, I think, for me. That we all have to shift. The reason why I say this, I always laugh, but it's not funny. I was watching a documentary of the farms in, in Scotland or somewhere. The guy's loading about 100 pigs in the car, and I knew these pigs are not coming back. And that makes me think, what the hell is going on? I mean, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, the, I, I mm -hmm. think like uh, animals have been eaten before, but now they're not eaten as like in normal life. Now it's about money, you know, I mean, they're like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's sad, but I want someone to convince me why should I be a vegetarian and a vegan as well. So not convinced, kind of like, 
we are talking about like some people need support. Yeah, they need support <laughs> to understand. Yes, it's healthy and all that, but the cooking of it, I think I need a lesson. Honestly, I can't. I can't really say okay to them cooking vegetarian. Yeah, I can have rice with beans and onions and whatever, but that's not really vegetarian. Vegetarian, I'm sure they got some uh, repisi. What's called some stuff they put in there. So yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know how to close the point to make is that yeah, eating health. That's what I'm trying to make to do. You know, and, and do you think there's something wrong about eating meat? Just yeah, just in your own view. Do I think what? Is it wrong to eat meat? Mm -hmm. uh, so in my view, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to eat meat, but I think we need to drastically reduce the amount of meat we consume. So I don't think it's healthy for us or the planet to eat meat three times a day, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really bad for, for everyone. Um, but for example, even if you reduce to having meat two to three times a week, that's already reducing so much the consumption. And if you make, and the thing is meat can, when you have something too much, you stop enjoying it as much because you take it for granted. So if you reduce the, the amount of meat you, may, you consume and then you take the time to actually prepare a really delicious meal, then I think you also enjoy the process more. Yeah. And, and it, veg, vegetables, I know that a lot of people have this prejudice against vegetables, but I think it's also because as a society, we, we have moved away from actually spending time in the kitchen cooking because we think that uh, because we're trying to be capitalist basically and we think that time is money and then any time that you spend is money that you're losing but the reality is that if you're spending time on creating something that's really beneficial for yourself and beneficial for your environment then we, we need to move away from this view that that time is money and that yeah. and actually think about how much care we spend with, uh, with the time <laughs>